Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar with Clean Horizon, where we'll be discussing one of the most pressing topics for the industry today, how to generate revenues from business models that are less reliant on ancillary services in common. I'm Andy Colthorpe, editor of Energy Storage News and deputy editor-in-chief here at Solar Media. We're always excited to bring you these webinars, but I, as I say, today's is on a really crucial topic that examines what comes next for energy storage assets as the industry reaches a new frontier in terms of maturity and smart business models. Markets have opened up to energy storage progressively around the world in the last few years. As they have done so, ancillary services such as frequency response or frequency regulation or even frequency control, the terminology varies a little depending on which market you're in. These have typically been the main set of applications that battery storage systems have first provided, particularly in front of the meter. And it makes a lot of sense because frequency applications generally require injecting bursts of power into the grid that can be done by shorter duration battery assets, which means they can be cost effectively and quickly deployed. Meanwhile, for grid operators and regulators, the need for grid balancing grows acute as renewables come online and thermal plants retire. And therefore, these services can be initially quite lucrative due to the high value they offer. However, as you can tell from the title of today's webinar, and most likely from your own perspectives and experiences of the energy storage market, the business case for energy storage does not end with ancillary services. In fact, while grid balancing ancillary services will remain an important and extremely important suite of applications that storage can provide, offering high value to the electricity system and society in general, in years to come, they will represent a relatively small percentage of what batteries are doing on the grid versus smart energy trading. As we go towards energy systems based on much, much higher percentages of renewable energy, these forward-looking applications will change the dynamics of this young industry all over again. Today, we'll be hearing from expert speakers at Clean Horizon, as well as a special guest speaker from Route to Market provider USO on what this means for your assets or investments. Our speakers today are Michael Salomon, president of Clean Horizon, Bart Picker, uh, managing director at USO, and Clean Horizon senior analyst, Amin Ben-Sharifa. Presentations will be followed by a panel discussion. And then as always, uh, interaction with you, the audience is very important to us. So please do put your questions for the speakers in the questions tab on the right hand side of your screen. And we will try and answer as many of those questions as we can within the short Q and A um, that we've allotted time for at the end. Now, while we try and answer as many as we can, uh, we won't be able to get to all of your questions by any means. But Clean Horizon um, representatives will be more than happy to reach out to you and continue that conversation uh, in more depth offline. And finally, before we begin, uh, just to let you know that the presentation slides will be available to all registrants um, and the recording will be available on demand on Energy Storage News as well as on our YouTube channel in days to come. So with that out of the way, it's my great pleasure to hand over to our first speaker, Michael Salomon of Clean Horizon. Hi, Michael, and it's uh, over to you. Hi, Andy. Uh, thank you for, for the introduction and thanks to uh, your colleagues at Solar Media for helping set up this event and uh, thanks, Bart. Thanks, Bart, for contributing. So just uh, uh, as we get started, just a uh, Quick intro. I mean, uh, so my name is Michael Salomon. I've, I've been I founded Clean Horizon 15 years ago. We have we have been since then a one-stop shop and then just a watch consultancy with amazing stats, as you can see here. So basically, we've we we work both as a market analyst and as a technical consultant. Um, he, you know, heavily involved in procuring and designing assets, storage assets all over the world. So we 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 act indeed both. As a as a as a market researcher, uh, we provide price forecasting, and we're going to discuss a bit of those the results of those forecasting in Europe, and then and then we act as a as an owner's engineer. Um, and and re re regarding the price forecasting, it's an activity that we we do mostly in Europe, um, in those countries there in white on that map, and uh, the, then and, and the other ones in blue are the countries for which we will be rolling out our forecasts 
pretty much starting this this month until the end of the year. Um, so, so you know, I, I will make a quick introduction so, so you understand exactly what will be our angle today. So, that introduction, you you don't necessarily have to read that slide. You you will be able to obtain it as um, as Andy mentioned. But I, I put there, as a reminder, the typical ancillary service that, that you can use to, to, um, to build a revenue stack for a storage asset in, I would say, most European countries. And they're, I would say, carefully split in two columns. The column on the left is the, are the services for which you're paid by the capacity that is rented. And the column on the right is the service, or at least the, the 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 service you provide to the grid for which you're paid for um, for the energy that you're providing, and in that right column I do include ancillary service as well as you know typical energy markets, and uh, this is more as a reminder for those who don't know. And again, when you you know if you read those slides later and you just can use this as a glossary if you wish, the 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 the, the one point I would like to be making today and which will set up the stage both for Bart and my colleague Amin, is that whether we want it or not, we are switching, shifting from the left column to the right column. Uh, another way to say that it would be to, to, to represent things um, in, uh, you know, on, on a time scale. Um, and for a few example countries, but I could have done this for many other European countries, and these represent the acronyms or the names of the market that you see here represent the main drivers or the main revenue line for uh, the storage revenue stack in those given countries. And it will be no surprise to those of you that have been in the business for a while that that acronym FCR, so, so the frequency containment reserve is no longer the the main driver for the for those revenue stacks and that actually prompts uh, a lot of changes in the way uh, the business case of storage assets in europe can be can be thought of so you know i i, I prepared you know, we prepared this one chart that hopefully will 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 leave a mark on on everyone's brain and if you can uh, if you can remember only that graph, probably should, should help you realize what the issue is. So what I'm showing here is the FCR prices in France, so which is you know, more or less um, almost the same with some difference, uh, some differences as the FCR prices in um, on, on the regulation platform. But again, France may be a bit more extreme on that, but at least it's, it's, it will set the stage better than in other countries. So I'm showing here the a monthly moving average for FCR prices, which is which are provided in euro per megawatt per hour, over the past almost five years, and as you see, okay, those prices have fluctuated. In uh, you know quite clearly, they were very high in the you know in, in the winter that preceded the energy crisis, and they remained very high during the energy crisis following the the um, the, the, the the Russian attack on, on Ukraine. The I added two lines two red lines on that graph. The bottom red line shows you the what I call here the profitability threshold, meaning the amount of revenue you should be getting on FCR in euros per megawatt per hour, which you should be getting every hour, every day, in order to be in the money, that is to have a, a reasonable IRR for your one hour battery. So you, you need to have I believe we computed this over 10 or 15 years, I'm not certain, but let's say you, you need to have this amount of revenue in euros per megawatt per hour every hour for multiple years, more than 10 years. And as you can see, indeed, whoever had a battery, either one hour battery or two hour battery, uh, anyone who had a battery during the energy crisis certainly had a lot of good years in terms of revenue, but you should just remove the you know, the chunk for the energy crisis in the middle of this graph, and you look at what was the trend before, which it was already below that profitability threshold, and it was actually trending downwards. And now that the energy crisis is behind us, it's, you know, the trend of SCR prices, it's just not that it trends downwards, it's actually that it reached almost zero. In a country like France, it's typically at approximately one euro per megawatt per hour, more or less. 
So that tells you that you know anyone who was involved in building business cases for energy storage relying on FCR, which by the way, was a very simple way to earn money with your battery. Once the battery was pre is pre-qualified, you just place a zero bid on the FCR auction and you just wait for the marginal price to clear and you just take the money. There's not a lot of, almost almost no steering to do, almost no, almost no uh, sophisticated trading to do. You just wait for the price to, 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 to appear and just cash in the money. Well, those times are gone. Uh, completely gone. They are behind us. And the reason why we set up this call is we do understand this, this webinar is that we do understand that this is a point of concern or of anguish even for some, uh, for lenders, for, for some investors or for, for some IPPs. And we thought it would be good to bring one specific route to market to this discussion in the name of Yuso. And this is why Bart will speak just after me. And the reason we, we asked him to join us is precisely going beyond just selling uh, capacity on the FCR market is something that has been going on for multiple years in one country in Europe, and that country is Belgium. And there's one, and if, and if, and if there's one aggregator, one route to market that knew how to do sophisticated, that has known how to do sophisticated trading on various ancillary services in Belgium, it's clearly you so. So I've asked him to join us to, to provide a bit of, of, of his return on experience. And then after this, my colleague Amin will will you know take the stage and and generalize Bart's experience based on real and past data to show what the revenues will be looking like according to us in other European countries once those you know FCR type revenues are are either completely gone or you know have become negligible. So without further ado, I will let the next speaker speak and uh, here. Thank you, Michael, and thank you very much for this kind introduction. And uh, thanks to Clean Horizon and Solar Media for the opportunity to basically present our company, our activities, and also share a bit our experience on the Belgian market. So um, the topics I would like to cover today, uh, I will briefly start by saying something about myself and uh, Yusu. This is the company I co-founded 12 years ago. Not everybody on the call might have heard of Yusu, as we are uh, uh, operating uh, batteries in a relatively small market, uh, Belgium, but now also expanding to the UK and other markets. Then I will go into the problem with, with renewables in a market-driven system and why you know the batteries are such a game changers in the utility landscape. And then more in particular focus on uh, energy strategies and the experience with the utility scale batteries we have in our portfolio in Belgium. Um, so a little bit about uh, myself. I'm an electrical engineer uh, by training and I had actually the privilege to witness the changes in the energy market uh, in the past 25 years uh, firsthand. I mean, that started, I mean, when I started my career, um, I was recruited by the National Dispatch Center in Belgium. It was uh, a very uh, regulated setting. Basically, as a dispatch engineer, we were planning both, you know, the large scale uh, coal, gas, nuclear power plants, uh, as well as the grid assets, because there was no unbundling. So that brings me to the first change our witness and that's the whole um, unbundling things we take for granted today like you know a TSO um, being responsible for the transmission lines the access to the grid uh, and and having uh, competing markets and institutions like you know the spot power markets um, or something that didn't exist like uh, 30 years ago and, and uh, I think it was very interesting in, in the first part of, of my career to work for a utility and to basically, I would say, introduce, develop uh, and bring the trading capability where after a while the assets were no longer, I would say, planned, but they were actually driven by prices on how they were uh, operated. But there was a, a second very important change in the energy market in the past 24 years, and that is the renewable um, uh, the renewable assets, because in the past uh, it required a lot of uh, uh, capital to basically build uh, large scale power plants. And with the advent of, uh, of wind, but definitely of solar, everybody could become uh, a producer 
And also the nature of the asset, a renewable asset, was totally different that from a power plant that, uh, that could be scheduled. And so actually um, uh, this second, uh, uh, I would say, trend, the, the advent of the, of the renewables bring me actually to, uh, to USO. Um, USO is um, basically uh, uh, a company uh, founded by myself and a previous colleague at, uh, at NG Electra Bell 12 years ago. And we started the company initially as an aggregator of renewable infeed. Basically, what we did is offering um, a PPAs, power purchase agreement to producers. And we did so with a particular angle is that we wanted to connect the renewable producer directly to the wholesale markets rather than offer, offering them a, a classic PPA with a fixed price. We were offer them a direct route to, let's say, the, the spot energy market, um, Bellpex, now Apex spot uh, at the time. And we saw that portfolio grow. Today, we operate something like um, 2,000 uh, renewable installations, an aggregated infeed uh, of 300 megawatts. But at the same time, we developed um, uh, a retail activity. You could say um, uh, the activity of an electricity supplier. Basically, in the beginning years, we were doing the opposite of an electricity supplier. We were bundling power on the distribution grid, bringing it to the to the wholesale grid, connecting it with markets. And while traditionally an electricity supplier was basically buying electricity wholesale and distributing it. So, but we also started an, uh, an electricity supply uh, activity, but doing so we stick to only offer you know, pricing on short-term electricity market. Also today, for our more than 500 B2B customers in Belgium, we don't offer any uh, fixed price. That also means that USO, because we both have the generation side and the off-take side, is ideally placed to offer products like, for example, corporate PPAs, where part of the power is, is priced against the market, but part is just bilaterally agreed between a renewable producer and an off-taker, or things like, you know, energy sharing, where basically renewable producers can peer-to-peer -peer or share their energy. And that also, you know, puts into context our experience with batteries. Um, we started relatively early with batteries. Uh, we operated first utility scale batteries more than seven years ago. It was a 10 megawatt, 10 megawatt hour uh, plant in the Netherlands, offering at the time only um uh, the famous FCR, Michael thought in the beginning, and actually you so showed there in that case that by having uh, smart uh, strategies around the FCR, notably with state of charge management, we were able to generate additional revenue, which was much appreciated by our first customer. And that basically brought the idea as we are a Belgian company with a Belgian portfolio to start developing uh, such assets in Belgium. And we believe that the Belgian market is uniquely positioned for, um, for battery, uh, uh, for battery storage. Here you see the, the list of the handful of utility scale uh, batteries we currently operate. I mean, all those have been in operations for more than a year. And all those, I'm very proud to say, have actually surpassed the initial business plan uh, that we established with these investors the day we sat together. So um, as a picture says more than, I would say a thousand words, I also uh, added some pictures of uh, utility scale batteries operated by USO in the Belgian market. And also one, the one on the bottom uh, right is actually of, oh, on the top uh, right is actually from the, from the UK, uh, and also very important and increasingly important for you so is the um, what we call embedded batteries. Uh, we're not particularly fond of the terminology front of the meter or behind the meter because any battery is behind an electricity meter, um, but we do believe that these embedded batteries, which are co-located with, uh, for example, solar generation co-located on a site where it's consumed, will also be a very um, play in a very important role in the energy transition. So while I will focus a little bit on utility scale, know that uh, USO is also uh, very active in uh, embedded commercial scale uh, battery system. So uh, before diving into the core of the topic uh, of uh, how to manage um, batteries, let's take a step back and first look at the problem with, you know, today's uh, 
Ali, the problem with managing a renewable portfolio in today's uh, energy markets. And to illustrate that, I here put, you know, a quite a random day. Uh, it's a, uh, of the real-time electricity prices in the Belgian market. And what you typically would see is that there is a very high volatility between the, the price of electricity in certain hours, notably, I would say in the afternoon when there's a lot of solar uh, uh, solar being generated, often leading to a real time price, which is zero or negative. And then, uh, you know, in other uh, time periods, for example, uh, in the evening when there's little sun and wind or when there's a higher demand, you all of a sudden see very high electricity prices. These electricity prices are driven by the balance of the electricity system and the whole balance is driven by uh, the dominant role utilities play in today's energy system. Sometimes uh, at USO we see ourselves as, you know, at the cross section of all power traders and all meteorologists. And uh, actually also in the company we have, um, yeah, uh, a weatherman working uh, alongside a uh, portfolio manager, alongside quants to really uh, get a grasp on how to operate in these complicated um, uh, electricity markets. Uh, now, why is it so hard to, let's say, manage a renewable for portfolio in the energy markets? Because, well, one, there are actually... Um, one very important reason is that despite all the sophistication of weather model, it's not possible to fully predict, uh, I would say, uh, what the weather is going to be on the day itself. I think we all experience that. We know that. And with you, so we also see that you can even have the best uh, weatherman, the best model, yet you can always be surprised by a cloud turning up or uh, a weather change. On the other hand, uh, the whole electricity system is set up that you need to be uh, in balance, that you need to announce the day before how much you're going to produce and how to commercialize that. And it's really very hard to do that. And I'll take a very simple example, and I hope I don't offend the, the intelligence of the audience or, or any speaker here is, imagine you just have one solar plant and uh, in the day ahead, you think that this solar plant will produce 100 units then obviously you will sell these 100 units on, on the market. And then on the day itself, uh, any of two scenarios can happen. Either it's the weather is actually a lot more favorable, a lot more sunny, and congratulations, you don't produce 100 units, but 120 units. Now, the problem is that these additional 20 units will have a very low economic value. Basically, they will be zero or even negative. But assuming it's, it's negative, you will then end up with a situation that you have collected revenue for 100 units, but you need to, your producers produce 120. So they really expect you to pay them for 120 units. Reversely, if during the day there is a change in the weather pattern and only 80 units are produced, well, you have a different problem because you're already committed to deliver, you know, to the exchange or to the TSO or, or to your counterpart uh, 100 units, but you only have 80 units produced. So you need to buy back 20 units and you need to do that at a very high price. So basically, you know, usually uh, you have like two scenarios, a good one and a bad one, but here both scenarios are bad and you cannot avoid that. I mean, if you basically produce more than you forecast, you lose. If you produce less, you lose as well. And it's really like uh, a lose-lose proposition. And at USO, we've been battling for more than 10 years, like how to deal with that problem. And over the number of years, we, we created quite a number of solutions with that. The first one is obviously, let's make a better forecast. And that's definitely something we've been working on a lot. Uh, the second one is, well, let's not only do day ahead, let's also make sure we adjust our portfolio during the day with intraday trading, with automated traded robot trading. And that's another avenue you can take. Another avenue you can take is, obviously make a more smart pricing and try to share the risk between the renewable producer and uh, I would say the, the, the renewable aggregator uh, in a more smart way. Uh, yeah, an, another thing that we do is obviously taking a more holistic approach instead of only forecasting the volumes in your portfolio. If you can really uh, forecast and get a grasp on you know, the market price and the market dynamics, you can obviously also position you very favorable. But our most, I would say, a favorite solution of dealing with this problem of renewables or batteries 
And the reason why we are so fond of batteries is because instead of a lose-lose proposition, it's a win-win proposition. A battery is always placed on the right side of the market because obviously a battery with the, the flip of a in a split second, you can switch it from being, you know, a producing unit, injecting power on the grid to being a, a consuming or off-taking unit. Uh, and that's a very, a very powerful uh, capability, actually. And to market this, this flexibility in the market, there are basic uh, two strategies. The first one is the ancillary strategy, what Michael says, the left column uh, in his chart. Uh, and the other one is an energy trading strategy, is the right uh, column and the one we're specialized in. Uh, with regards to the um, one way to think about these two different strategies is who steers the asset. In the ancillary strategy, it's really the TSO that steers the asset. You basically hand the keys to your battery for, a, for let's say, a certain interval, be it four hours or a day, to the TSO and the TSO based on the frequency, based on the country system imbalance, will steer the asset for you. There's nothing uh, you need to do. You don't need to be particularly smart in uh, generating revenues in that way. In the other way, it's really like holding the dispatch right and steering the asset yourself. You don't commit anything to the TSO, but you just operate the, the, um, the battery and the energy markets in uh, the most favorable way. Uh, note also that both strategies are actually a merchant strategies because in both strategies, the battery owner needs to take the outcome of a market process as revenue for, uh, I would say, income for, for its plant. So in practice, how does that look like? Here, you see it uh, mapped out for the, for the Belgian market. You see again the acronyms uh, that Michael has presented uh, coming forward with. So concretely, there are like eight different markets where a battery owner can generate revenues on uh, the Belgian market. And in the day ahead, or, or starting even two days before, there's a very there's a cascade of auctions of market processes uh, which you can participate in. And obviously, the, the key of your route to market provider is to make sure you obtain the best price. And one way we do that is, for example, if you think about a market like FCR, the purely capacity-based market, uh, we will help our owners bid in always not at zero and take the market price, but also always with an opportunity cost perspective. You know, we will always put in a floor uh, where we see uh, a level that we could generate, uh, I would say, revenues with the battery and an energy only strategy. So it's very important for each step you take in this logistics team to optimize that compared to uh, the market. So in order to do so, uh, we need to harness a lot of, uh, I would say, um, uh, IT, because ob obviously you need to decide every two seconds how to steer your asset, be it, you know, because you get a signal from the TSO or be it because your algorithms and your trading strategy says so. Um, and ultimately, it's actually this, this outcome of this process determines how uh, how much revenue and what kind of revenues that are generated. And I put here, you know, a very concrete case of uh, a utility scale best in Belgium. I will not disclose which one it is, nor for, for which month. And you can see that at the end of a month, um, the, the revenues that were, that were generated were a mix of energy and ancillary uh, strategies, but actually the majority of all revenues uh, generated were coming from energy strategies. So actually what Michael is saying, you know, it's shifting and it will be the future. I would say the future is already there and we see half or even on some months, you know, three quarters of the revenue generated with uh, energy uh, strategies. So we also actually recently uh, started activities in the UK. It was actually, uh, UK is in that sense a much more transparent market because you have this kind of, you know, a lot of information is published by uh, the UK TSO and uh, I would say information providers pr produce then a kind of a leaderboard on who generates which revenue. And we were all obviously very proud to share that uh, uh, we have been able, we have managed uh, to raise to the top of the leaderboard for the UK route to market provider for uh, a one hour battery system. Um, so, but coming back to also the topic of 
the seminar today, uh, why it's important to think beyond strategies. And I think it's just uh, looking at the size of the potential market for your battery. Uh, I put here um, the budget that uh, the TSO in Belgium, Elia, has for the procurement for ancillary services. And it's approximately like 200 million euros a year. Compare that to just uh, the day ahead and the intraday market, which have, you know, with a very rough estimate, uh, at least 4 billion euros in, in, in revenue or energy trading. So you see that there's actually the energy market is 20 times bigger than the ancillary markets. And I think this analysis is vastly underestimated if you would put today's numbers with today's volatility. Uh, and if you look even at other markets with uh, it, it's, it could easily be a factor of 30 or 50 times that the energy markets are bid or, or, or bigger than the ancillary market. So it's crucially important that uh, there is an energy strategy for your battery uh, uh, to benefit for optimal from this uh, flexibility. So the main takeaways I have for today and I would like to share and we can then discuss is that uh, the main challenge with renewables are uh, the intermittency and the balancing cost. The balancing cost is not merely a concept for energy nerds. I'm convinced that any renewable investor will really need to understand uh, how these balancing costs arise, how they can be mitigated to really continue to develop, um, I would say, renewable assets and, and, and obviously increasingly so uh, uh, batteries. That provision of the ancillary services, it's a good start, uh, but it's a niche compared to the wider need for flexibility in the energy system. We see increased penetration of solar and wind. We see no, no end to it. So these batteries need to be deployed uh, in uh, the energy market to balance the system. Uh, also very important is that you partner with a route to market provider which who is able to optimize across the ancillary markets and across uh, the energy market, both in standalone configuration, that's where the asset is directly connected to the grid, or where the asset is embedded, co-located with local production, local offtake, um, which we will also increasingly see. Uh, using big data, algorithms and automation are at the heart of uh, a route to market activity. We have a very strong IT team at USU to manage all this data. And I also think that the Belgian market is ideally designed to optimize it, uh, to optimize this revenue. As I, I illustrated, one thing is our real time energy market, the single uh, imbalance price. Another thing is that, for example, utility scale batteries, they get an exemption for grid connection tariffs. Uh, in Belgium and also our TSO, Elia has really developed uh, a number of products uh, in, a uh, in a technology neutral way so that basically batteries can participate in a level playing field in the ancillary market, but also, you know, they can uh, participate in the, um, the real-time uh, energy market. And we feel we are uh, uniquely, uh, but the, the I would also say on the Belgian market, this is not uniquely limited to Belgium. We see the Belgium is actually at the forefront because they're implementing the ENSO E model. So we see more and more other markets and our experience with the UK, who's even no, no longer part of the European energy market, shows that that uh, in a lot of markets, they will, this will become crucially important. So we feel uh, uniquely uh, positioned in this market who would be very... Uh, I would say motivated to, to also enter into discussions through Clean Horizon with any potential future owners of battery or current owners of batteries. With that, I'll, um, I'll hand it over to the next speaker and uh, I look forward to the interaction in the panel later. Thank you. Thank you, Bar Thank you Michael. Um, Michael and Bar um, discussed the, the present and uh, the past revenues, and I'll be discussing the, what we are expecting for the future of um, energy storage business model. And to do so, I will introduce first um, Cosmos, which is a tool that we have developed at Clean uh, Horizon. And with this tool, we can um, simulate the dispatch of a storage system in the different uh, markets uh, and calculate the potential revenues for a storage system uh, or um, a hybrid system with PV or, or wind. 
uh, over the, the the lifetime of the project 15 or or, or, or 20 years with these revenues we can calculate the um, the cash flows uh, considering all the costs of the projects in order to calculate the NPV and IRR of uh, of the energy project and with all these uh, values we can run different sensitivity analysis uh, to determine the the, the, the best uh, sizing for for the storage system the capacity or the duration and also for PV and wind and also the grid condition if uh, applicable if uh, applicable so how does uh, this tool work uh, well in um, cosmos we are dividing the markets into two segments first uh, markets uh, where we'll take decisions one day before uh, these markets are auctions that are cleared one day before and we know the results one day before it's the case for the day ahead for the primary reserve fcr secondary reserve if applicable and uh, the afr uh, market uh, and also uh, for a hybrid system the pv and wind uh, um, production so for this market what we are doing is we are taking into consideration all these prices considering a perfect foresight for this process and for the production of uh, pv and wind and considering the technical constraints of the system the state of charge the size uh, the grid connection uh, limits, the degradation, the number of cycle limits, and also the market rules. What's the uh, minimum energy requirement to participate in the market? Um, what's the oversizing needed to participate in a given market? So all this uh, will be used to run a linear optimization and determine the positions in each market for each uh, trading um, period. Um, then, these results will be uh, considered as constraints for the second step. Uh, we're calling here the D-Day simulation. Uh, and uh, it's for markets where we can change the position up to a few minutes before uh, delivery, depending on, on the market. And for these uh, uh, markets, we are not considering a perfect foresight of, of um, of prices so we're not using a, a, a linear optimization but what we are doing is uh basing our, our our trading strategy on threshold buying and selling threshold that are calculated based on historical data to maximize the revenues and the the tool will discharge when the prices are higher than the the, the selling threshold and charge when the prices are lower than the uh, buy-in threshold if uh, if possible so with this uh, approach we can navigate the complexities of the energy uh, markets uh, effectively and uh, enable us to have uh, very interesting uh, results and revenues close to uh, what will be done by a route to market and to run our uh, uh, our tool, we need a price forecast so that we can do uh, long-term uh, predictions of, of the, 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 the revenues. And price forecast is also a, a key expertise at, at Clean Horizons. And I will be sharing uh, results from uh, Belgium, France, Germany, and Spain in the next slides. And we can start with uh, Belgium, where we can see that the the trend is very clear where the revenue is coming from energy trading and here in energy trading i'm considering they had uh, intraday a for our energy and a for our energy um, trading so these revenues are are increasing in the first years the the revenues from ancillary service will still uh be at 50 60 percent of the total uh, revenue uh stack this can be explained by the fact that in Belgium, the, the prices for ancillary services are quite high compared to other European countries. For example, the FCR in Belgium last year on average was around 25 euros per megawatt per hour and AFRR up and down was around 50 euros per megawatt per hour. But with more batteries installed in, 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 the, in, the, in the country, um, prices will go down due to cannibalization 
and the revenues from energy trading uh, will, will, will count for a, a higher share in the revenue stack. The second country is France, where we are expecting a similar uh, trend uh, for ancillary service re revenues. Uh, the, the, the difference in France is that revenues or prices for ancillary services are already uh, uh, very low. Um, last year, the, for the FCR, was around seven euros per megawatt per hour, and the beginning of this year, we're very close to one euro per megawatt uh, per hour. Of course, um, the air for our capacity will, uh, uh, is expected to be uh, launched this uh, year uh, in, in France. So another or a new um, uh, revenue for ancillary services. But uh, as in Belgium, uh, with more um, storage expected to be installed in, in the country, the prices are expected to go down and the revenue is coming from energy trading to uh, increase. Another difference also for France is the revenues coming from the capacity uh, mechanism, which are uh, interesting because it's a fixed revenue for the uh, for the for the storage system and it doesn't depend on any trading uh, strategies, which is not the case for ancillary services and not for energy trading. And the third country is Germany, where we can see that the 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 revenue stack is very similar to uh belgium with first years the revenues coming from ancillary services are still uh, very uh, high in terms of percentage this also uh is explained by the fact that revenues or prices for for ancillary services in in germany uh, are high compared for example to france and the, the uh, fcr price around eight and the a for r plus uh, up and down uh, around 30 euros per megawatt uh, per hour. Uh, but for a country uh, with very high uh, storage penetration, the second largest storage market in Europe after uh, the UK, uh, the, the revenues coming from ancillary services are expected to go down also, uh, and uh, revenues coming from energy trading to uh, increase. Um, and in Germany, uh, the, the intraday continuous is a very interesting uh, market where probably a lot of revenues will come or energy trading revenues will come from this market because it's very uh, liquid and w it offers uh, a lot of uh, opportunities for, for a storage asset in Germany. Last country uh, is Spain and I want to share uh, the, this, this revenue stack for for Spain just to show a slightly different story um, where um, the, answer, the, the revenues coming for energy trading uh, are not representing long-term 80%, 90% of, of the revenues. Uh, and the ancillary services are expected to still at a high level compared to uh, the other uh, countries in terms of uh, percentage. This is mainly due to a, a historical trend where uh, the the, 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 the spreads um, in the energy markets in Spain are lower than the, the spreads in uh, other countries. For example, last year for the wholesale, the, um, the spread was around 50 euros per megawatt hour in Spain compared to uh, almost double uh, for, for Germany with around 100 euros per megawatt hours for the day ahead uh, spread. So, to summarize, uh, the, the, the revenue model and the business model for uh, energy storage asset is um, shifting from uh, uh, from um, ancillary services uh, based uh, uh, business model, especially uh, FCR historically, to a model where the, re the revenue stock is more diversified and where the energy trading revenues will represent a higher uh, share. This, of course, comes with uh, a lot of challenges for the stakeholders in the industry, but also uh, opens up uh, very interesting opportunities for innovation and different trading approaches in the energy uh, sector. Um, with that, I think the floor is yours, Andy, for the final discussion. Thank you very much, Amin. Uh, yeah.
brilliant presentations from the three speakers. I can see that our audience's uh, audience attention was uh, very well held, and lots and lots of brilliant questions coming in. Now we have so many questions from the audience that we are not even going to be able to do maybe one or two percent of them but as i mentioned before um the panelists and clean horizon are you so will be more than happy to continue those uh discussions offline after the session and in fact some of them may be a little bit too technical to uh, to handle in this public forum anyway but um yeah as i say they will do their best to get to them um but before we get to those audience some of those audience questions uh, a few questions from me and i think uh, hopefully some of these will answer some of your audience questions as well so uh, yeah without further ado um i hope you're ready panelists um and let's go so uh first of all um i mean i think one for you uh, perhaps in light of, of what you've been discussing uh, around cosmos so yeah how can developers in europe today figure out the best duration and sizing of their projects in each market and we had a lot of people actually in the audience chat asking questions about duration so yeah what's the best what are the best ways to figure out the uh, duration and sizing of your project interesting question um i'll start with answering for the sizing first well sizing is uh more or less a trade-off between cost reduction due to economy of scale when you're increasing the size of your of your um, project uh, and uh, the available revenues and also the constraints of uh, of, of your site and um, so no straightforward um, answer uh, but the sizing is the biggest issue especially in countries where the demand is um for uh, for services is around uh, more than 500 megawatt or around 1000 megawatts it's the case for big countries like germany france the uk it's it's more an issue for countries we will talk about it in this um in this presentation but very interesting um markets also the, the nordic markets uh where the ancillary service revenues are still very uh high uh, last year for example in finland uh, around 20 to 50 euros per megawatt per hour um, for for uh, for, for uh, FCR um, markets, but the demand is around 50 megawatts on average. Uh, so the sizing is very important. Uh, installing a big um, uh, battery can easily cannibalize the uh, or saturate the the market. For the duration, um, uh, I think. The most interesting thing is first see what the, in the industry is, is doing. Uh, I'll, I'll take the, the case of, of Germany, um, uh, second largest uh, storage market in, in, in Europe. Uh, if we see the, the installed um, uh, projects, the average or the weighted average uh, duration, uh, and here the weight is the capacity, it's around one hour. Uh, but for the uh, uh, under construction and uh, announced projects, we're more around the two hours. So there's a trend. We're increasing the duration. Uh, and this is and this makes a lot of sense because, as, as we said, the, the business model was more an FCR-based business model where it makes a lot of sense to have a one-hour system and add increasing or paying the cost, the extra cost of uh, a higher duration didn't make a lot of sense. Now we are switching to FRR capacity, uh, energy trading, so we need more um uh, duration uh so the the answer is it depends on the opportunities available in, in the market and of course with more energy trading uh revenues uh we need more uh, duration and for some uh, countries for example in in, in belgium and, and i think bob can tell us more about it um we are seeing a lot of projects with a four hour um uh, duration uh and maybe bar can uh, can talk more about uh, four-hour duration projects. Um, that's great. Yeah, but you had that project in that you mentioned in Ruyen, which is twenty-five megawatts to a hundred megawatt hours. So being, yeah, pretty. I think an early example of a large-scale four-hour duration project. So yes, yeah, as, as Amin says, um, is that something you can talk to us a little bit about? Please? And what, what made you decide to go for that four-hour duration? What was the kind of process there? Well, I can say a little bit about it. Obviously. Uh, I mean, uh, how the projects are established and what the customers are doing, it's always very bespoke and a confidential process. But I remember clearly when we embarked on the Ryan process, our initial plan was to have a one hour 
FCR battery. And that was basically the business plan. And we were staring at this FCR. And then, you know, in the project, as we were managing the renewable portfolio, we could see the value of the energy strategy. So we, we, we were actually, you know, pushing very hard for a two hour or a four hour system. But eventually, because of a turn of events, uh, the project had to uh, reset and you know every setback is also an opportunity so then we put uh, finally there was like a, a runoff between a two hour and a four hour system and because we clearly saw the value of this um, of these energy strategies we ended up with a four hour system so it's really something that I would say uh, grows and depends also on the market opportunity but the trend is definitely uh, towards uh, towards longer duration systems as those are more suited to generate revenues with with the energy strategies okay excellent thanks bart uh, yeah and in in terms of uh plans that change and applications that change um michael i was wondering um if projects that are initially deployed largely for ancillary services um if they can shift towards providing primarily energy trading and capacity applications or Will most of these newer opportunities be for new build projects only, do you think? No. So in terms, okay, so so there's there's multiple levels to answer that question. So first one, the obvious one and a bit confidential in a way, um, so far as it doesn't interest a lot of people. But if your project is an older NMC type pre, pre-2020 NMC battery, the odds are that you can't change much because the actual cycling of the battery like it's precise cycling is is is, is like enshrined into warranty. So those batteries you just doomed. You just do whatever it's designed for. But for projects that are older than this, then it's okay. I mean, you you, you can always change the way the battery is dispatched. Um, uh, and even if you have a one-hour battery, technically you could go to do the trading. You would just be less energy to sell, right? But if you really want this to be a four-hour battery without doing anything, you just you just you just erase it. You just use a fourth of the capacity and that's it. So it's a bit of a pity, right? Because you're just using a fourth of your connection. Now, the bad idea, oh, let's see, if you want to create um, a fire, uh, you could just uh, add battery banks next to your existing projects, next to your one hour project and say, oh, here's a four hour project. Well, it, it will probably burn. Uh, because of you know the way the system is designed, because of the short circuit current or or whatnot, or even for the communication issues that you may be facing, all all of the above. So if, if you really if you don't want to down derate your system, if you really want it to become a four system, you probably are more or less condemned to either building another project next door, or or at least you know. You know the PCS are not so expensive these days, so just just adding a full AC level, three hour AC level system next door, and you slightly oversize in terms of PCS, but it's just better than burning it, everything down. So yeah, so you you, you sort of can do it, um, uh, but if you're the the short answer is you one way or another you're more or less starting a new project next to your old one to be able to do this properly uh well no, short answer okay okay terrific Thank, thanks very much um and this next question i think i'd like to think this coincides with uh quite a few of the questions from the audience but uh given that i'm a, a journalist of i think probably it's fair to say more limited uh technical understanding of these topics. I'm going to ask it in, a, in probably a simpler way than many of the audience members did. So uh, I was wondering what sort of long-term expectations on revenues uh, developers can give to their investors. And I think probably equally, I suppose, as the intermediary there, what sort of, uh, sort of long-term expectations on revenues route to market providers can give as well. So I don't know if Bart, maybe you want to take that question first. And um, I don't know if uh, Michael, you might have a, a, a follow-up view or a, yeah, let's see where we get to with uh, with Bart's reply first. Well, I think you know, looking for the long term revenue expectations of 
of this kind of assets. I think it's very important also to realize that all these markets, uh, FCR, EFRR, uh, the ancillaries and the energy, or they had intraday balancing, they don't are in isolation. As I showed in the way we optimize them, one is linked to the other. So fundamentally, they will be driven by uh, the energy markets and not so much about the price level, because I think it was Michael who said in the beginning that after I would say uh, the energy crisis with uh, uh, the Ukraine war, we've seen actually power prices come, come down, but actually the volatility has not come down. And if we look at the penetration of increased renewables, uh, we don't see that coming down. So I think in the long term uh, expectation, it's very important to keep the fundamentals in mind and how essential the battery will will be. I mean, we sometimes get the remark of long term investors, yeah, but if there will be a lot of uh, batteries will it not be like a flat power curve? Well, basically, we don't see that as the need for flexibility will be so high and cannot be matched even with the current pipeline of uh, batteries. Now, for, for a particular number, I mean, we know that in all these projects, we have a double digit return, but uh, we uh, at USO basically we rely on companies like Clean Horizon to provide us with you know, price forecast, volatility forecast, which are a bit like the raw material, which we then use together with our trading strategies to, to generate a revenue forecast. So I think it's, uh, uh, we're not really like the best person to say like, what will be uh, the volatility or the price for the coming years? I think it requires a fundamental approach and the approach of uh, that Clean Horizon uh, has. So maybe Michael, you can comment yeah. on your private well, forecast. Just giving me the hot, potato here so yeah. so so uh, uh, well okay so so far so, so uh, what we see is the following in europe almost all of the revenues are merchants okay for storage assets maybe some exceptions to this but let's let's make a general statement um so uh you're doomed to rely one way or another on price forecasts which as an investor or especially as a lender, you may feel extremely uncomfortable with, especially if you were, you know, a spoiled kid of, you know, the flat, you know, feeding, feeding tariff or the market premium in the renewable space where everything is set for 25 years. So it doesn't work like that on those markets. So, so option one, you just go with that. You go with the best of the best of the providers <clears throat> of forecast, for example, us, and you just, and you just, just go do it. That makes a lot of people uncomfortable. So they go to routes to market like Bart, uh, or even to some other players like some route to market that are utilities, and they ask for w w one of the two options. Number one, give me a floor, give me a floor, and so essentially they're asking the route to market to just take the market risk. Then the route to market is the one exposed to market risk, so it is the one depending on our forecast or somebody else's forecast to head or not is going to take the risk, and. So that's option one. And option two is even more aggressive or that's less aggressive, which is for the investor. They, they go to another type of route to market, usually backed with the utility. And those guys provide a tolling agreement. Tolling agreement is looks just like a very, very high floor, but I'm talking north of 100 or north of 100,000 euros per megawatt per year. Like, like, and essentially what the, what, what, what the tolling agent says is, I'll take your system for 10 years. I'll pretty much I will cycle it the way I want and I'll give it back to you after 10 years, not in a very good shape. So it's a way essentially for that tolling agent, that, that route to market slash utility to just say, I wanna be exposed to storage you know, profits, but I don't wanna put the CapEx. So I'm just gonna I'm just gonna lease it in a way from from somebody else. I don't get all the mess of building the asset, permitting the asset, and I don't get I don't get any of the mess of decommissioning the asset when it's fried. And so you know these are your options. So obviously, as a as an investor, as a lender, that third option is comfortable, but probably as you, know, you will say, Bart, of course it's comfortable with you because it's risk free, but it's because it's risk free ish. Uh, it's it's free, free ish, but obviously you don't get a lot of the upside. Right? There's nothing. There's no free lunch. So these are your options, right? So, uh, well, but but I no. was just about to say, Michael. You know, there's no uh, free lunch, and what we see in right. these proposals of uh, tolling is that 
potential investors and owners of battery would leave a lot of money on the table. And we believe the key is really like, you know, understanding the market, understanding the balancing, and you basically want to keep, you know, the flexibility and the upside on your side, because that's the way to generate these good, these good returns. I think the investors of, I mean, looking, I cannot speak for them, but I would imagine if they would have taken any of the tolling uh, proposals that, well, they didn't really exist, but tentatively would be there compared to the returns they now see on the market. Uh, I mean, yeah, no risk, no return. And I think the key is really understanding it, being comfortable with it. And it's not really so merchant because, you know, if even if ancillaries will go down, the volatility will increase, you will make it up with an energy strategy. If it's not imbalancing, it will be in the ad. If it's yes, not yes, in the ad, yes, it's, in yeah. the it's really about uh, this new kind of environment uh, uh, getting comfortable with the nature of the markets and the volatility. Absolutely. Chaps, now I feel like uh, <laughs> you guys could continue this uh, debate for, for some time, but it's just in the interest we, of keeping we've things We've had it for 10 on. years, so we can... Oh, it's on. brilliant. No, I love it. I love it. I'm sure the audience does too, but I'm sure they'd also love to see some of their questions answered. So I'm going to throw in a couple of these audience questions as we're going, because this one, I think, does kind of, uh, does quite nicely, uh, let's say, dovetail on to, to what you were talking about. So... A couple of questions, one of them from uh, Yusuf. So thank you very much for your question, Yusuf. Asking, how do you define the profitability threshold? Uh, ah. What IRR and at what co CapEx, OpEx and lifetime? Okay, okay. I guess that's kind of what you were alluding to just there. But yeah, no, yeah, I, it was, I, I, th I think yeah. it refers to that slide that I showed. You, you might want to show it again. Oh, can I show it? I'm not sure I can. Yes, I can show it. I think, uh, it, I refers think, to, I think yeah. it refers to that slide there. Yes, I've seen this question pop in and out of the questions there. So we computed that. Okay, so this is just a rough assumption, but uh, this is a 15-year computation with a 12% target IR, uh, a capex on the slightly high side of uh, for one hour battery of 450,000 euros, which we split in 200,000 euros per megawatt hour. Clearly more expensive than what you get in on the market these days. We're going to publish a report on that soon, so. Yes, it's, it's it's higher than what you get in the market, but order of magnitude is okay. And 250,000 euros per megawatt. So that includes, you know, the permitting, the transformers, the PCS, the, all the, you know, everything you need to do to, to, to connect your asset. And so that's 450,000 euros per megawatt. That's the CapEx. Uh, and as far as OPEX, blah, 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 you can frame it the way you want, but it's more or less 10% per of, of the CapEx per year. And actually, if you zoom on it it's more like two or three percent is the fix the fix opex like your performance guarantee and whatnot and six or seven percent or maybe seven ish percent is actually uh the the cost of recharging the battery and the grid fees on on the battery recharge right and so if and if you assume that all of that uh you know and and also remember you may know that there's um there's also a 20 percent uh, I forgot I call this in English. There's um, if if you want to permit one megawatt of FCR, you need to you need to show the market 1.2 megawatts. It's a uh, oversized. Yeah, there's oversizing. Yes, there's a forgot the actual name there. But uh, so if you factor all that in, there you go. Uh, you're going to get that 12 percent IR with a 13 euro per megawatt per hour payment if you have a one hour system and 18 euros if you have a two hour system. So, you know, you could you can do this math on an Excel spreadsheet with like no sophistication, just multiplication. It's just, and you you'll you'll find those numbers. But these these were our assumptions. Spoke too fast. Sorry. No, no, not at all, not at all. I think it's appreciated uh, given given the uh, the just, restrictions just, on just, time. It's just math. Yes. There's a few. Yeah, I mean, there's a few other questions around kind of you know risk appetite from investors and and sort of profitability uh, threshold, but. There was a question here about, so I just wonder if this is a variation on, so you can uh, point me in the in the right direction if not. But so Hitesh, uh, thank you for your question. Ask, have you managed to determine the minimum intraday price spread or delta required to execute the intraday trade? Or to clarify, what is the minimum threshold between buying and selling energy for intraday trading? Um, does anyone want to take that on or is that one that's better um, discussed offline? Uh, I'm happy to uh, share a bit how we think about that. I mean, there, there are a lot of um, elements that you need to factor into account on looking what kind of intraday spread would be suitable. Obviously, you know, batteries have a physical reality, so you only can cycle them with a certain uh, 
number of cycles. So you need to take into account, you know, like the vendor, how many cycles do they permit? Is there a, a limit, you know, per day, per year, per uh, that? And then you also need to figure into account like battery degradation, like how, how much do you want your battery to sweat to be left? And uh, I mean, at USO, basically our approach has been, well, let's involve the investor in that and different investors can have different risk appetite and we already see that some say well you know use our batteries maximum let it sweat even if it's you know at the limit of what the vendor is permitted and others would be saying well let's be more cautious we have here an asset that, that that's envisaged to to have a life expectancy of 10 years or 15 years so we really um do um yeah i think it's uh, when determining this spread uh it really depends on uh, uh, all these factors, actually, and there's not, not uh, a unique answer. Uh, and very important also, even if you set, set a spread, the market will give you what the revenue is. So it's also very important to look back and we do that very Ali, daily, but also uh, monthly or every trimester on like what spreads are on average generated with the asset. And is that in line with, you know, the strategy we want from the asset? So. Um, that's a bit uh, our experience and how we deal with that. Okay, thanks. And I mean, I think, um, yeah, in terms of the battery degradation, I think there's a few people ask questions about that. But that's, I presume that's something that goes into the uh, the, mod the type of modeling work that you do. So yeah, just wondering what if you have a particular view on that. And I think there was a specific question on that. Essentially, uh, so Roman was asking how important is battery degradation when trading your batteries? And is it something you're considering at the moment? It is. It is very important, and of course, we are uh, considering it um, uh, every year. The, the, the available energy capacity is um, uh, modified to take into consideration the degradation of uh, the battery, and the degradation of the, prof the degradation profile depends on the cycling. So, also, we are taking consideration the cycles uh, limit, and this is also. Uh, sensitive analysis parameter to determine, especially when we are considering a lot of energy trading, what's um, the best uh, number of cycles limit uh, for, for, for an energy storage system. So yeah, of course it's taken into consideration and it's a very important parameter. Cool, and in terms of uh, that modeling as well, you know, we had quite a few questions coming in from the audience about uh, co-located or even hybrid uh, renewables plus storage projects. So just wondering, yeah, what sort of market participation models are possible for those? And yeah, how, how you view that? Yeah, that's a, that's a less straightforward uh, answer. It, it, short answer, it depends on the on, on the project, it depends on the country. Um, there are some benefits for our, for for co-location, uh, depending on the, the country or another project, reducing the, the, the grid fees. Uh, also discharging uh, during uh, peak hours. So really the, the business model really depends on the, the spreads in, in the market and how high the prices during peak hours are are, are, are compared to um, prices uh, when PV is producing, for example, in the case of, of PV. But the drawbacks is you are limited uh, due to the grid connection uh, limits. You. <coughs> If your project was designed for for a PV uh, project, and then you want to add a, a a battery, and the, the grid connection is limited, uh, so you cannot uh, fully use both of your uh, assets. So there's a sweet spot that you can find with using a sensitive analysis using our, our tool Cosmos, uh, but uh, there's no straightforward answer to say it's better with standalone uh, PV or uh, location absolutely okay yeah i guess those participation models are still something to be worked out and you know i think there's a lot of people trying to do uh solar plus storage in particular and you know kind of kind of working those challenges out okay so folks i think probably one last question for today and um i'd like to ask um you know that you know obviously we're talking about move away from providing uh, primarily ancillary services but you know ancillary services are have been a foundation of revenues for best stack uh, revenue stacks for best historically so do we still see ancillary services an important uh, set of applications that best 
I will continue pr to provide, uh, Michael. I mean, I guess ancillary services yeah. have been really important for, for you guys uh, and all of us to uh, now. So yeah, how do, you, how do you see the future of that? So, so the, here's my, um, uh, you know, well, here's my, here's my thinking. The, it will remain vastly important over in the foreseeable future. However, how vast this important is, it will slightly change. So let's say between now and the next three to four years, it remains, you know, it's a make or break for the business case. It's just how it is. And as you know, we've seen in a, I've shown this in a bit of a catastrophic manner when I use, I purpose, on purpose, I showed the friends FCR, which is a bit more aggressively trending downwards than the other FCRs, but I, I had to make a point, you know, it's, it's, it's just manipulation. Uh, you know, propaganda, that's how propaganda works. But in general, there's a downward trend on ancillary services pricing in, in Europe. And uh, in that context, you know, probably one of the most key sensitivities in valuing the, you know, an energy storage project in Europe is actually the, you know, your, your commissioning date, the COD. If you lose one or two years of commissioning dates, that's a lot of IRR percentage points that are going away. So that's actually what you do not want to do. Now, but that being said, voila, those business cases, as we build them now, and as we will build them next year, we'll rely on ancillary services, period. What will happen after this? That's my thought, but may, this may change. I, I do believe that there will be uh, some form of um, subsidizing scheme for storage that takes place in Europe. And we're seeing the few, the first few examples of this in to the Spanish tenders, to the Greek auction, et cetera, et cetera. So, so those things are appearing and I think they will materialize simply because down the road, uh, we, we just can't keep producing PV or wind, especially PV when their capture prices are going to drop. So at some point, uh, you know, any form of incentive on those will go because what needs to be incentivized, if you really want to put renewables, we need to incentivize the fact that we just shift and control their generation, you know, their, the time at which they, they generate their power. And that means subsidizing storage. Again, I'm not saying any word about the scheme, but what happens is even if there's a subsidy there, again, whatever the format, there will still probably be a fraction, a smaller fraction of the of a merchant exposure to sto of storage. And in that, probably the ancillary services of, for that small fraction will still play a huge role. So, you know, even if 50, 60, 70% of the CapEx is more or less covered, you know, this will be the difference between ancillary services will be the difference between a 7% IR and a 12% IR, for example. So today it's life or death Tomorrow, it may be just eh, boring profit versus interesting profits. This is really how I see the, you know, the revenue stack of storage systems to take shape in the next 10 years. Excellent, excellent. Thanks very much, Michael. That was free, um, that was free. Did, did they pay for that? Did they pay for that? That was just free. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, any thoughts on that to finish on, Bart? Well, uh, my views are quite aligned with those of Michael. Eh? I think, you know, the ancillary services market will remain very important for batteries, but I would even say that batteries are so well suited for ancillary services that in the future, the ancillary services will be only provided by batteries. <laughs> but it's not the reverse, you know, batteries will not only be used for ancillary services, they will be used for energy strategies and way beyond ancillary services for the reason mentioned by Michael, because we cannot realize the energy transition and the big penetration of renewables without deploying them for the energy strategies to shift renewables, to shift grid constraints, to shift all that. So I think it's um, yeah, v very interesting to see. And also like the pricing in the ancillary markets will be set by the energy market. It's not because there will be so many batteries that all the pricing will be done by batteries that the ancillary services will uh, will go to zero because no, obviously they will have an opportunity cost in the other market. So I think it's uh, not one or the other, but both of them, but and all by batteries, yes. Fantastic. All right, folks. Um, thank you so much uh, to our audience members for joining. There's, I can see in the questions tab, there's 
quite a few of the audience members are thanking all of you for the uh, speakers for the uh, for the presentations and the webinar but you know conversely i think we say even more than that thank you so much to the audience uh, for coming on but certainly from my point of view um yeah i'd like to give a heartfelt thanks not uh, to uh, to michael to amin and to bart uh, guys it's been been really great having you on here it's been a lively discussion i think everyone's really benefited from your from your expertise uh, and your insights and it's been a lot of fun as well i think we can we can all agree so yeah so just want to finish up with all of that and uh, yeah well, just one final thank you so much to our audience and not just thank you for joining but thank you so much for being a part of this incredible um, industry that is transforming the way that a lot of us think about energy, the way we use energy and, and, and everything else around that. So from myself um, and all at Solar Media and Energy Storage News and from our speakers and panelists, thank you so much for attending and we'll see you again soon. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you guys. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye.